we have students coming on ground that are maybe um, already exposed and, you know, so as long as we're in the, you know, in that kind of yeah. twilight zone of whatever's going on. So, um, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to just kind of give you guys a little bit of an update and some reminders. And then I'll turn everything over to Zoe again. Uh, Capstone Mental Health Assessment is due tomorrow night. Uh, your psych quiz is due Wednesday night, psych quiz number two. Uh, there is no class on Wednesday, that is Veterans Day, and all classes and clinicals are canceled. Um, your final capstone module opens up on Thursday, that would be your leadership. Yay! And your mental health post-assessment is due this coming Sunday night. Um, so basically, we have tonight and next Monday night left for mental health. And, um, and then I'll be coming back on Wednesday the 18th to cover emergencies and disasters. Um, and, and then the following week will be exam three. So do you guys have any questions for me? No. I do, but I don't know if it's something that you want me to email you about. It's about the cultural competency. Um, uh, no, you don't. Uh, you need to okay. upload it into Blackboard um, uh, under, the, under the assignments. So I did it a while ago, and I was having trouble getting back into it. I think I told you that before. They gave me a new password. I got back into it, and it looks like all of the stuff that I did is been deleted. Oh, well, then you'll have to do it again. That's you know, it's the only thing I can say. If you don't have any screenshots that you can show me, then um, you're going to have to go through, go and do that again. I try to call them and see if they can help. Yeah, me. see if they can retrieve it. Yeah, it was a lot okay. of work. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, okay, I will um, see you guys next Monday night. Um, have a great week. Okay, bye, friends. Okay, guys, welcome back to another week or second to last class. Usually, well, historically, I would have given the exam guides to you on the last night, but I, I'm going to give it tonight and then give you a week to mull it over, see what you're struggling with, what issues you have, and then so that gives us time on the last night to discuss or, or clear up anything, okay? Okay, somebody already started the recording. Awesome. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about somatic symptoms and related disorders as well as personality disorders. So there are a lot of different disorders that fall under this title. We have somatic symptoms disorders, body dysmorphic disorders, functional neurological symptom disorder, conversion disorder, illness anxiety, issues in lingering. I must say, I've had quite an influx of new intakes and I have one patient in particular who is dwelling in malingering. And as we get to it, I'll divulge more. So somatic symptoms disorder, as the name states, is a presence of a physical symptom, somatic concerns that suggests a medical condition, but it's not fully explained by any medical condition, even though it suggests. The physical symptoms are not intentional, so this is not the patient who, well, by all intents and purposes, is intentionally doing this. This is, in fact, a disorder. So when this patient presents, there will be no diagnosable medical reasons to account for their symptoms. 
these symptoms will in fact cause well as they interpreted cause them significant impairment as well as distress so you will see this in any medical setting hospitals community health centers wherever you work you will most certainly come across patients who have this somatic symptom disorder we saw a patient in neurology that had this disorder um they thought she had um, MS at first because she would um, at times not have any muscle strength at all and couldn't even get up and walk around or at, at all. And um, she didn't want to accept that it had to do with like heightened anxiety and stuff like that. She kept looking for an actual medical reason. Like, yep. Yeah. Sounds about correct. So this is the patient who will have a history of many complaints before age 30, occurring over several years, resulting in several doctor visits, hospital visits. It'll probably be the child who started in the school nurse. I was a school nurse for 10 years, and you had some kids that you saw them several times a day, many times a week. This patient will have a high level of anxiety about health and signs and symptoms. They will devote an excessive amount of time to the signs and symptoms. However, as I mentioned, they cannot be explained by any medical conditions. They often have high sensitivity to pain. They will think it's more medical, as you just stated, rather than psychological. And if it is in fact related to a medical condition, their complaints or their impairment will be in excess of what is expected. So this is the patient who probably sprained their finger and, all, and they can't move the entire arm. <clears throat> their symptoms are often described in colorful, exaggerated terms. It can cause an effect on their interpersonal relationships, no doubt, and it can be mild, moderate, or severe. So this patient will have an excessive preoccupation with an imagined defect in their appearance. So it could be their face, their nose, they think they're overweight, lots and lots of different reasons. If they have a slight physical anomaly, their concern again will be marked excessive over what it really is, so their insight will be poor. They will not be able to reason through it effectively. It could be a small little dot here, and they think half of their face is covered with something. Again, clinical significant distress can be tormenting. It depends on how the patient views and, again, their coping skills. In males, it could be about their muscles, diet, exercise. It could be genital concerns in females. It could be comorbid with eating disorders, which could be, it depends on how they view themselves, which could lead to this eating disorder. Often associated with OCD, and as I mentioned, a history of repeated hospitalizations, surgeries, and usually begins in the adolescent years. I had a new intake for a patient today who actually didn't show. So before I have my intakes, I usually get a history. I can look in or EMR and look at their like, if they're participating in hospitals that use this EMR, it can look like if this patient has been in the hospital. And as I checked with this patient, over the past two weeks, this patient has been to Yukon, Harford Hospital, St. Francis, Hospital of Central Connecticut, back at Yukon on Saturday, back to Hospital of Central Connecticut on Sunday. So they didn't turn up for their appointment today, so I'm unsure if they were in fact admitted. And as I read through the notes, more than one hospital would say malingering, or she has these somatic complaints. So as the patient experiences somatic concerns, one or more of their symptoms can cause altered voluntary motor or sensor function, which could suggest a neurological, as I'm not sure who spoke, but as you mentioned, it could suggest a neurological issue or a medical issue. For motor, it could be weakness, 
paralysis, tremors, or seizures. If it's a sensory issue, it could be skin sensations, sensory loss, vision, hearing, slurred speech. So it'll, as it shows, it could be a wide variety of issues this patient presents with. There will be often an incompatibility between signs and symptoms, as is recognized by a neurological or medical condition often precipitated by conflicts or other stressors in the person's life. And I'll hear this sometimes from my patients. Oh, my boyfriend left me and I, I ended up in the, in the emergency room. Oh, what happened? Oh, I, I had such a hard time breathing. My asthma was acting up and I, and I was passed out. I thought I was in a coma. I was like, oh, wow. As you listen to the symptoms, you realize that it's more a somatic issue than it really is. Or my leg was hurting and I couldn't walk. I had to call the ambulance to come get me. So usually precipitated by a stressor. Again, symptoms are not intentionally produced. Symptoms does cause distress. Acute is usually less than six months. Beyond six months is a persistent affair. And there's often a secondary gain from these signs and symptoms. So. In the case of my boyfriend left me, it was probably because oh, maybe if I end up in the hospital, I'll get his attention. He'll come and stay with me because I need help. Whatever their reasoning, but it is often for a secondary gain. Anyone ever come across anyone with these symptoms? Yes, um, I have a question. What is the difference between malingering and conversion disorder? So conversion disorder, like when I have an exam, I need to use the bathroom a lot. So that anxiety is converted into something else. That malingering, it plays a lot more into the, like the somatic symptoms where one will present. Okay, so let's see. There will be no medical conditions to account for what's going on. However, this patient will present and complain constantly of what's going on. You tell them they're okay to go to work. They will say, no, I need a few more days off work. Is that clear? Yes, I have a patient in my nursing home that has a diagnosis of both conversion and malingering. And malinger, right. So they will, as we get into it more, you will see more of what? Malingering is. And that conversion too can be seen in patients that have like probably like paralysis, blindness. So whatever it is, it can present into something else. So here we have hypochondriasis, which is the illness anxiety disorder. This person has a preoccupation with fears of having a serious disease based on the person's misinterpretation of the bodily symptoms. The preoccupation persists despite appropriate medical evaluation and reassurances. This preoccupation causes clinically significant distress or impairment. This person will be checking their body often, easily anxious about their health, usually lasts a while. Very low prevalence, but this is again is related to poor insight. The hypochondriac, this is something we've heard pretty often. Anybody know any hypochondriacs? Factitious disorder. This is intentionally falsifi falsification of physical or physiological symptoms. The motivation is to assume the sick role. They often have repeated hospitalizations in numerous cities, states, or countries. And it could be from falsifying medical records to even ingesting substances like insulin to get false lab reports. Know they're menstruating and go to urinate and you know there'll be blood in their urine but fail to say it was because they're menstruating. They'll say they're depressed because my husband died, but in fact, they were never married. 
probably ingest fetal fecal matter to cause sickness. So this, so this is the patient who is intentionally falsifying things in an attempt to assume this, this sick role. Um, it could also present as Munchausen by proxy. Has every, everyone ever seen that movie? I think it's on Hulu um, with Gypsy Rose. It's a true story. Yeah, that was scary. Yeah. And it's even scarier to know that it was true or that it is true. So whenever you find some free time, oh my goodness, what is it called? I'll think about it as I talk. I usually don't watch anything on TV because I don't have time to watch anything on TV. But after watching one episode, I had to watch them all. But it's a true story about a mom who had one child by proxy. And it is worth the watch. This is the person who deliberately produces or pretends as if someone else has a psychological or physical sign symptom. The motivation, of course, is for that person to assume the, risk, the sick role. The act. Yes, thank you. And here we get to malingering. The intention false or grossly exaggerated signs and symptoms motivated for external incentives. I mean, we have all malingered at some point or the other. I mean, you, whether it be from school or work, you call in, you say you're sick because you need a day off. Or it could be for jury duty, military duty, to avoid some other responsibility. You have to go do something and you're like, oh, I'm not feeling so well. So I have a headache, but you, oh, my head is pounding. I can't even get out of bed. I can't see. So malingering. It could be as a means of obtaining drugs. And it's usually what I see. Like if I have patients who are drug seeking, they will go to lots of different hospitals. And they will produce these symptoms because they know if I go there very anxious, what am I going to get? Valium. Xanax, clonopin, anything from that family. A benzodiazepine. So it could be for drug seeking reasons or for monetary compensation. You're driving, you got you got, you are barely tapped. On the back of your car, you can barely see the damage yet. You can't walk, you're in a net brace, you're going to physical therapy because you know there's a monetary gain from having an accident. As I see pseudo sciences here, false pregnancy. This I was actually looking forward to meeting to uh, meeting this patient today because just reading her history, I could know she had a lot going on. She presented to the hospital on Saturday, and she told them that she gave birth at home a week ago, and she needs post postpartum care. And but when they checked the hospital records, they realized she was in another hospital three weeks ago and had a negative pregnancy test. So there's no way she could have been pregnant to the point where she gave birth a week ago. So even false pregnancy malingering. Then we go on to the personality disorders, which can be kind of fun. As we talk about them, I'm sure you're going to start picturing those people. You're like, uh-huh, that's what she has or he has. There's a paranoid schizoid, schizotypical, antisocial, which is something a lot of people like to say, I'm so antisocial. There's the borderline, the histrionic, narcissistic, avoidant, dependent, and the obsessive compulsive. So a personality disorder is an enduring pattern of inflexible behavior. The pattern is usually stable and of long duration. So these, pa these patients would have probably had these from earlier years, and it, and it carries on throughout the years with them. Sometimes it presents um, just by how you interact with people, you realize this is just not normal communication, or they have difficulties in just accepting rules or different things. And you'll get even just a slight glimpse into there is something else going on here. The pattern of behaviors usually leads to clinical significant distress or impairment in their function. And it's manifested in two or more of the followings. It could be in the way they reason through things. It could be in their affect, how they react with others, 
or an inability to control their impulsive impulses. As I mentioned, you usually in the early adolescent or early adulthood. This person often lacks a genuine sense of self or self-regulatory abilities. So it's not it, it's their personality, it's who they are. So it's not something they can consciously control. So personality disorders are in different groups. You can have cluster A, B, C. So cluster A are those patients or those people who appear odd or eccentric. That would be your paranoid, schizoid, schizotypical, schizotypal personality disorders. Those in cluster B are often dramatic, erratic, and emotional. Cluster C, You'll see those who are anxious and fearful. So sometimes patient can be a part of one cluster, but as you get to interact with them, you'll see that they cross across clusters or have more than one personality disorder. We're going to look at Cluster A, and this is the odd eccentric personality disorders. We have paranoid, and as the name states, paranoid. Does anyone ever interact with anyone who's just paranoid? They have a pervasive mistrust and suspiciousness of others. It's like whatever, whatever anything, anything anyone else does, they had they question it. They suspect others are trying to exploit them harm them, deceive them. They have unjustified doubts, like this person has never done anything to them, for them to um, think they are out to harm or deceive them. However, they consistently think that this um, someone else is trying to. So their reasoning is usually unjustified. They're often reluctant to confide in others. Oh, I, I don't tell anybody my stuff because no, nobody's gonna listen to me. I can't trust anyone. They, they, they have those issues. They often read hidden demeaning or threatening meanings into, into simple benign remarks. So this is not the person you can find that you can just joke with because they find a bigger meaning into everything anyone has to say. They're unforgiven and they usually persistently bear grudges. So they hold on to whatever it is that they perceive happen, and they will definitely hold on to those. They're often very quick and easy to react or counter react. So it's almost as if they're always, always on edge. They have to protect them. They have to stand up for them because they feel like everybody is out to get them. They often have recurrent suspicions without justifications. This is the person who thinks their husband or wife is always cheating. They will hold on to ne um, negative stereotypes of like cultural groups or any other group in society. Someone said, yes, they knew someone who, it, they know someone who has a paranoid personality disorder. Want to give some insight? That was Shannon. Yeah, I'm always the one that's talking, so I'm like, do you really want me to talk? Um, it is good to know that there's someone else at the end of this laptop. <laughs> so I, I work in a nursing home, and we have a lot of people with mental health disorders, and I have a lot of paranoid schizophrenics that live there, and some of them just... I'm just, I'm thinking of a lady right now. She comes up with these giant like plans that she's like successfully breeding dogs and all kinds of things like that. And she's constantly making phone calls. She, two days ago, she tried to buy a cockatoo off someone on the internet for $1,500. Oh, and wow. she lives in a nursing home because she said she's going to successfully breed them, but she knows nothing about birds. But um, she's just very out there, but she's also extremely paranoid. If someone moves her shoes in the room, she'll never wear those shoes again. She thinks people are trying to poison her food all the time. 
and her food has to come up on paper plates. She has to have plastic silverware. Nothing can be reusable because she's constantly thinking that people are trying to poison her. You know, she put things in her food that aren't edible. What are some and nurses? I'm sorry, Shannon, you were still talking? Oh, no, I was just thinking, and she's always a two-person assist. Um, she has like extreme accusatory behaviors, so they never allow her to have one caregiver. And even if I, as her social worker, is coming in the room, I have to go in with another person. I can't go in alone. Right. So that was going to be my next question. What are some nursing interventions you could institute with this patient who has a paranoid personality disorder? So that's one, you know, she always has two people come in the room at all times. I mean, they do always give her disposable, um, you know, food containers. She has to see them take the food directly. Like she has to be the first person served on the unit because she has to see them take the tray off the uh, cart and bring it right to her. She has to watch them do it. Okay. And also, how about for their meds? Oh, medications, you cannot pop any medications beforehand with her. Yes, you have like to pop some other people, them. They would put them in a cup. Hers, yeah. they have to be done directly in front of her. You have to show her every single thing you're giving her. Exactly. And that is your paranoid personality. So remember, they always think they're being deceived. Pretty important to remember. They persistently hold on to grudges. They find hidden meanings in very benign remarks. So it could be the simplest thing. And they read into it. Schizoid personality disorder. This is a person who has a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of emotions in interpersonal settings. So totally detached from social relationships. It's usually indicated by four or more of the following. They have neither a desire nor enjoy close relationships, including being part of a family. So sometimes you, you know this person who's just a loner, they like to be alone. So it's not just they like to be alone, they have a personality disorder, which how it presents is they're loners. They almost always choose solitary activities. They have little, if any, interest in sexual experiences. They take pleasure in few things, if any. They lack close friends or confidence, other than like, my mother, my sister. So first degree relatives, usually they keep in touch with, but outside of that, no. They appear indifferent to praise or even criticism. They show emotional coldness, detachment, or flattened affect. And you will see this a lot in especially mental health patients, schizoid personality disorder. So this is the loner, but it's just not mental health patients. You'll see someone else who probably is along the along the spectrum who will present with a schizoid personality disorder. This is your loner. They will do by themselves. They will choose to work by themselves at all times and do their own thing. Not so much into relationships, not so much into conversations with others or feeding into any criticisms. They are loners. Schizoid. Then we have schizotypal. This is a pervasive pattern of social and impersonal de deficits as it relates to close relationships, as well as cognitive and perceptual distortions and essential behavior. So we had schizoid, and schizoid was a loner. So now we have a schizotypal. And this person has ideas of reference. And they are non-delusional, or they will incorrectly interpret things. Who else do we know have ideas of reference? What other mental illness presents with ideas of reference? Schizophrenia, thank you. This is a typical personality disorder, often has odd beliefs even magical thinking, like they think 
about aliens. I had a patient last week who was telling me about all the aliens that are in the sky and they will come and get us one day. They usually have perceptual experiences, including bodily illusions. They often have odd thinking, even odd speech. Often suspicious or have paranoid ideations as well. Inappropriate or constricted affect. Odd behaviors could be eccentric. Again, they will lack close friends or confidence with the exceptions of close friends or family members. Excessive social anxiety. So this is the person who doesn't want to be out of the house, doesn't want to be in public. It brings them so much anxiety because they often feel as if they do not fit in. Schizotypal. So probably like, I can't remember all this stuff. But should you ever do an intake on a patient, you look down there, this diagnosis and you see a schizotypal personality disorder, key things to remember. They have ideas of reference. So there could be some incorrect interpretation of things, odd beliefs, magical thinking. So this is the person who you probably think is having a psychotic break, but it's actually a part of their personality. Usually have perceptual experiences, suspiciousness, so a little bit of paranoia as well, inappropriate affect. So it's good for you to know these things so you can know what expected behavior is. So that is cluster A. Then we have cluster B. That's the antisocial personality disorder. Did you guys remember when we discussed conduct disorder in children? I said, as they age, they turn 18, it's no longer a conduct disorder. It becomes an antisocial personality disorder. This is a patient with a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violations of the rights of others. And it starts around age 15. They usually have a failure to conform to societal norms. They do not respect rules. They're deceitful. They lie. They use aliases. They con people. To be labeled as antisocial, they need to be at least 18. So any if these behaviors are in anyone before age 18, it's conduct disorder. That's what it is called. They're usually impulsive, irritable, aggressive, have repeated assaults. They have a reckless disregard for safety of self or others. They have con consistent irresponsibility, a lack of remorse, lack of empathy, lack of feeling any kind of guilt. Anybody know anyone with an antisocial personality disorder? No? Can someone, can someone be diagnosed with an antisocial disorder like after they have a TBI or like a mental health disorder after they have a TBI? I don't know why I'm asking. Um, so for them to have an antisocial personality disorder, these symptoms would have started a little earlier. So I wouldn't say specifically in relation to the TBI. I know I have, I have a lot of patients who have had TBIs and as a result of the TBI, they have a lot of aggressiveness and irritability, right. right. But are they lying and stealing and, and being deceitful and no concern for anybody's feelings? Like just... Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they can be they can be difficult patients as well. So maybe they had an antisocial personality disorder before the TBI. Oh, maybe. So that's possible as well. But I, I can't say specifically that it is caused it's by... It's just ringing a bell because I have like a couple patients that have TBIs and all of these symptoms are things that they seem to do. Well, so maybe there is. I'd have to look more into it to speak definitively. Okay. okay. I have, I have, I think like two patients that um has this diagnosis. Um, one that stands out since I've been seeing this guy for like two years now, and our appointments don't last any longer than maybe two, three minutes, even though it's half an hour. He refuses. He refuses to engage. And he's always very on edge. And when I say on edge, like he comes in and he sits on the edge of the chair. And he's very irritable and brash and just very aggressive. And I'm, as I'm going through my questions, like I need to, he's like, are you done? Can you hurry up? I need to go. You're wasting my time. And that's how he speaks to me. And I have had to like put my foot down. Like this is your medication appointment. And in order for me to prescribe, I need to ask these questions. 
So if it is that you will not engage and I'll be unable to prescribe. So now he allows me to ask him, but because he's so irritated by me asking him, no, yes, okay, no, yes, done. And it still takes no longer than two or three minutes because he will not engage with me at all. That is his antisocial personality disorder. And usually, as we mentioned, this is the population you'll probably find getting into trouble, being incarcerated because of their inability to follow rules or respect others. Then we have a borderline personality disorder. And I must say, this is probably one of the most difficult personality disorders to work with. And usually I have, it's pretty, it's pretty common as well. And usually like if it's my first time interacting with Shane, just by going through my intake process, I was like, there's some borderline, there's some borderline issues presenting here. And sure enough, my suspicions are usually correct. Um, it's not, it's not a specific word they use, but it's usually how they communicate with you. It's usually in their tone. And as we go through them, you can probably think of some people that you know um, that are like this. They have instability in their interpersonal relationships. It means like just how they talk to and work with others. Or it could be with their self-image, their moods, and they can also be impulsive. They have a frantic effort to avoid real or imagined ab abandonment. They have an intense demanding of interpersonal relationships with idealizations or devaluation. So this is the patient who often wants to be the center of attention. They have a persistent, unstable sense of self or of their self-image. So they could be concerned that they're not good enough, they never measure up to anything. And it's not quite depressive symptoms, it's kind of more so in their personality. It's kind of who they are. So it could lead to body dysmorphic disorder, it could lead to anorexia, bulimia, because they have this issue with their self-image. And this is why when we, when we talk about com comorbid things that go with anxiety and depression, we have personality disorders, most specifically a borderline personality disorder. This is a patient you'll see probably engaging in the cutting. They have loose boundaries. This is the patient who comes into my office and, oh, girl, your outfit looks so fine. I love those shoes. Where did you find those? And I'm like, ah, oh, kind of crossing the line here kind of thing. So that's usually your borderline. Inappropriately friendly, that's usually your borderline. They can be impulsive, potentially self-damaging behaviors. They often have recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, threats, or self-mutilating behaviors such as cutting. They have chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. It can be very sarcastic, often followed by guilt. And this is usually one of the hallmark symptoms I had. My very first patient this morning, he does not have a borderline personality disorder, but I, I definitely over treating him for a few months. I have, I have a, a student, and as we discussed it today, I said, what are those tendencies that you pick up? And she, and, and she very correctly said, it sounds borderline. So we're talking about his treatment. It's a follow-up management. And I ask, um, are you engaged in therapy? And he goes, well, I've been waiting for a call from Jane, and Jane hasn't called me back. So he said, from you. I've been waiting for a call from you guys, and you guys haven't called me back. And Jane said she would call me, and I'm the sick and tired of you guys not doing your part. And I said, you can't throw it in my lap because that was your job. And he's like, oh, now I feel like shit. I feel so horrible. And uh, I can't believe I effing said that. And that is the end. It's going on. I'm like, no need for apologies. We're just talking here. Oh, and, and now it's your fault. You made me feel like this. And he went on. And I was like, her, her mouth is wide open, dropped on looking at me. And he hung up the call. And I let a few minutes go by. And I called him back. And I'm like, hey, this is Zoe calling back. Would you like to finish your appointment? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, did you see how quick I just shift my mood? Did you see how quick or, or how irritable, or irritable I got just so easy? Now, is that the patient who, if you could reason through it effectively, is that the person who was appropriately irritable or angry? Okay. 
No. No, inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. It was more so, um, I'm going to show you how I can get. And I'm sure he was waiting for me to call back. And you're probably like, it, it all seems so abstract, Zoe. But when you encounter these patients that have a borderline personality, you will kind of have some more insight into how they present. Inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. It can be very sarcastic often followed by guilt. So when I called him back, he was so apologetic, apologetic, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, there's no need to apologize. But of course, it's a part of his, and I will appropriately label him as having a borderline personality disorder. Um, suicidal behaviors, every single time I see him, he'll tell me he's suicidal. He's never without um, suicidal feelings, nor does he, it's an opportunity to, inform, to re-inform me how many times he's attempted suicide. But then he'll add, oh, but I'm too chicken. These are the patients that are very, very needy. Very, very needy. So it is important for us to understand that it is a presentation of their disorder and for us to treat them like we would any other patient because it is in fact a manifestation of a disorder. I know it's easier said than done, but as nurses, we have to remember that we're there for patient first, okay? So the borderline patient, this is the patient who will engage in splitting. What's splitting? What do you think splitting is? So going back and forth, seeing things as good one time and then bad the other. So not so much, but not too far off either. So this is the patient who, no, not split personalities. This is, this is the patient who you told, uh, let me, I'm trying to find a good example. This is the patient who you told, the doctor said, or maybe it's something, I'll say you're giving out treats on the unit. And the patient can only get one treat per shift. And they already got their treat <clears throat> on the shift and you go back in there, oh, and that's why Mary told me I could get two treats whenever I want. So you have to be the, um, the hard ass, don't you? And maybe I should just go talk to Mary when I want something. So that's like, putting up like splitting people, like splitting or Mary, Mary already told him that he couldn't have a second treat, but he's going to tell you that Mary said I could. This patient, under all of these things, as much as they present with these behaviors, they most what is driving most of their like the hallmark of their behaviors is fear of abandonment like they have this fear that people will will abandon them or push them away idealization this is when they present something that's perfect or better than it is in reality. So whether it re relates to talking about themselves or personality that they like or something they engage with in, this is the patient who will seek to make it appear a whole lot more than it truly is. This is the patient who will project and we looked at uh, defense me mechanisms. And what do you think projection is? Is that where you're to, like taking ownership of someone else's feelings? Like you're 
somebody is mad, so you're mad too? And you think that you were the one that was started being mad? So let's look at the root word of it, to project. So your thought is correct, but only on the wrong person. As the other person is causing it. Yes, so you're projecting your feelings onto the other person. Then we have our histrionic person. This is excessive emotionality and attention seeking behaviors. So this person will be uncomfortable in situations where they are simply not the center of attention. Who has those girlfriends who are like that? They need to be the center of attention. It's my mother. <laughs> Their interaction with others is often characterized by inappropriate sexual seductiveness or provocative behavior. You know that girlfriend, it's a simple backyard cookout and you're like, what are you wearing? Because you know she likes to be the center of attention and she just always have to just add that little provocativeness to it. They can have rapidly shifting and shallow expressions of emotions. So this minute you're really close to her, you invite her to all your events and she'll come. The next minute she's giving you the cold shoulder. You're not so quite sure what's going on. She he or she, and I'm saying she because it's, I've seen it most often in women, consistently uses physical appearance to draw attention to self. So this is the person who wears their hair pretty blonde or huge hairstyles or the way they dress. They will spend a lot of time on looks and clothes. So they're making sure their nails are done every week, their hair is done, new outfit. They're always pretty well put together because this is who they are, the way they present themselves. Their speech is usually excessively impressionistic, but it lacks detail. So you want to like, who are you trying to fool? Like, who are you trying to impress? They have very dramatic and exaggeration, exaggerated expressions of emotions, easily influenced by others or circumstances, often considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. Does anybody know anyone they could fit into this histrionic box? It's usually that very overbearing person, just like they're just too much. I have a few people in my life that I, without a doubt, know they have a histrionic personality disorder. Then we have the narcissist. This is the patient who displays grandiosity, a person with a need for admiration, a lack of empathy. So what are some things we'll see? A grandiose self of importance. They're preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty. They believe they're special and unique and can only be, under, and can only be understood by other people who are equally special and unique or of high status. And I'll get those patients in my office and they're like, one specifically said, uh, don't you think I should be treated by the doctor and not just an APRN? Because of my serious mental illness, do you think you're qualified enough to treat me? They often re require excessive admiration have a sense of entitlement and an unreasonable expectation of special treatment. Like I sat out there for five minutes. Like, why did you let me wait for my appointment? You should be waiting on me when I get here. They can be very exploited for others around them. <laughs> they can be very exploited for others around them. They take advantage of others to achieve their own ends. Their self-esteem is, is, is enhanced and mirrored by the high value they place on others around them. They lack empathy. I have a patient who's a nurse manager and he's a narcissist. Lord help those nurses that work underneath him. 
They're often envious of others or they believe others are envious of them. They're arrogant, they're haughty people. Criticize, criticism often makes them feel empty, humiliated, because how dare you criticize me? Because they truly believe they are who they perceive themselves to be. And if you know no one in your life who's a narcissist, you will at some point cross paths with that narcissistic patient. Someone said their ex, and I can see how that could cause interpersonal difficulties if you are in a relationship with a narcissist. We have avoidant, and as the name states, ah, <laughs> my cousin. Kelly, I heard it's familial. I'm messing with you. Then we have the avoidant personality disorder. And as the name states, they avoid things. Social inhibitions, feelings of inadequacy, and a hypersensitivity to negative evaluations. This person will avoid occupational activities involving significant or interpersonal contact because of criticism, disapproval, or, really, or rejection. So this is not the person you will see engaging in a group activity or working with others because they are so sensitive to being criticized. They're unwilling to get involved with other people unless there's a certainty that they will be liked. I mean, how can you be sure that others will like you? So just that tells you how much they will engage in other activities. They expect to be criticized by others. I know they'll talk about me. I know they're talking about me. They feel that that is what's going on at all times. In intimate relationships, they'll be very introverted and restrained because of a fear of being shamed or ridiculed. Again, a fear of being rejected in social situations, which will inhibit their personal situations due to them feeling inadequate. They'll view themselves as inept, unappealing, inferior. So this is the person, oh no, oh no, that's okay. Oh, that's too much for me. I, I can't manage that. And deep down, it's that fear of being judged, of being criticized, feeling that they're not good enough, feeling that they're not enough that's feeding those Behavior. So as the name states, avoidant, that avoidant personality. It could be the person, it could be the person who we all describe as the shy. But probably if we look more into their symptoms as they mature into adults, so they realize that there is a lot more going on behind this need to avoid. So there's avoidance and then there's dependence. This is the person who wants to be taken care of, which leads to a submissive or submissive or clingy behaviors because they have a fear of separation. They will have difficulties making everyday decisions without an excessive amount of advice and reassurance from others. So this is the person who needs someone else in their life for them to function. They need others to assume the responsibility for most areas of their life. They need someone to tell them how to spend their money, to tell them how, to, how their day should go. They have difficulties expressing disagreement with others. And why do you think they have a, a difficulty disagreeing with others? Because they, was that an answer? They don't believe in their own opinion. Yes, because they depend on somebody else to approve everything they do. So they're not going to disagree with anything anyone has to say because other people's opinion matter most. They have difficulties initiating products, projects, or doing things on their own. They wait for others to start things thinking they can do it better. They go to obsessive lengths to obtain nurturance and support from others. To the point of even volunteering for something unpleasant, you're like, why would she do that? Like, are you kidding me? This is the person who has a dependent personality. Like, that's what he did to you and you agreed to do this? Yeah. She has a dependent personality, or that's what he, um, she said she'd do when he agreed to do this. So it's not necessarily male or female. It affects both. They will feel uncomfortable or helpless when alone. So this is the person you're like, didn't she just break up with? 
Jack last week, then why is she with Michael today? She can't be alone. Dependent personality disorder. So, and, and I'm sure it's not just can't be alone, but if you look at all her other behaviors, you'll see that she has check, check, check. Next thing you know, you have five, six of these, and you could say it's a dependent personality disorder. Urgent, urgently seeks another relationship as one closes. Um, often unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of themselves. So this is a person who just doesn't want to assume care for themselves. They depend on other people. And as I mentioned, you can see this person volunteering or putting up with unpleasant behaviors in order to assume the dependent role. So what do you think you can, see, or where do you think you'll most often see this kind of person? What kind of relationships? Abuser. Yes. And people ask, as I'll tell you, it couldn't be me. But that person is happening to her over and over and over again. That's because we have two different personality types. So it's not so much she's choosing to stay, it's because of her personality disorder, which is dependent. So then we have the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. This person is preoccupied with orderliness, perfectionism, and mental and interpersonal control. So usually manifested by four or more of the following things. This is the person who is preoccupied with details, rules, lists, orders, schedules. This is the patient who has everything organized to a T. They show perfectionism that interferes with their task completion. They could be, say they're painting a room. It takes them forever to paint the room because they have to make sure it's totally nicely trimmed up top. They're not dripping any paint. They're, um, the streaks are even. So they get so caught up in getting it done that they have a hard time getting the job done. They're often excessively devoted to work and productivity with the exclusion of leisure activities and friendship. So this is the person who's not taking vacation or time off work because I have to get it done. It's work and I'm supposed to be at work daily and I shouldn't be taking time off to go have fun or do nothing. They're usually over conscientious, inflexible with matters of mortality, ethics, or values. So this is not the friend you're going to go out and do something unethical with because they'll be like, no, you can't do this. It's breaking the rules and, and they'll give you all the reasons why you should not be doing what you're doing. They'll, they're often have a difficulty is discarding outworn or worthless objects, even when they have no sentimental value. Reluctant to delegate tasks. So what other disorder could you see this person developing if they, if they um, have a difficulty discarding worn out or worthless objects? Order. Yes, they all could also be hoarders. They're often reluctant to delegate tasks or to work with others unless they submit to exactly the way they want things to be done. Very often they'll end up doing it themselves of a fear that others will not do it well. They have a miserly spending style towards not just themselves but to others. Stubborn, rigid, and unwilling to consider a change in plans. So that's your obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So while some people will say, I'm so OCD, do they have an obsessive compulsive disorder or do they have an obsessive compulsive personality disorder? So, the, so that's something to look at, okay? Next time you want to, I'm sure I'm so OCD. So some nursing diagnosis we could have for the different Groups. It could be other paranoid, schizoid, schizotypical. It could be ineffective coping, anxiety, social isolation, or the borderline, histrionic, narcissistic. And this is the, the group that didn't play so well with others. You don't get along with a lot of people. It could be ineffective coping, chronic low self-esteem, risk for injury, impaired social interactions, or risk for directed violence. For the cluster C, where we saw mostly anxious and fearful behaviors, 
It could be anxiety, ineffective coping, chronic low self-esteem, or impaired, impaired social functioning. It, so how do we treat a personality disorder? And it's funny because the only person with a personality disorder that will point out to me that they have this personality disorder is usually my border, my borderline personality disorder patients. Like as you ask them to list their diagnosis, they will often list, oh, I have BPD. And I try to clear, is, is this bipolar disorder you're saying you're having? No, I have a borderline personality disorder. And I'll be like, okay, how do we treat it? There is no specific medications for treatment. It's not like this is FDA approved for a personality disorder. We have to treat the symptoms. Well, with the exception of borderline, because um, borderline, you see those depressive symptoms, those anxious symptoms, and we use SSRIs. But as it relates to therapy, which is often the most effective treatment for these personality disorders, they can do DBT, which is the dialectic behavioral, dialectic behavioral therapy. And this is again is a specialized form of therapy where someone where you have to get trained specifically to run these sessions. It could be an individual session, could be group, could be family therapy, behavior modification sessions. It could be anger management, depending on the disorder that's presented. It could be in the form of art, play, recreational. So Know that it's mostly through behavior therapy that they're treated. And sometimes if they have, if it's like with the schizoid, schizotypal, where they have those ideas of reference, even though it's non-delusional, depending on how it presents in their life, we treat the symptoms. But for the personality disorder itself, it is more so treated with therapy. And that is it for somatic symptoms and related disorders and personality disorders. Any questions? I have a question. So how, how do you know if these are just um, like a personality trait versus a personality disorder? So remember, as I as I lift them out, remember my Bible, I tell you, um, well, that is used for diagnosis, the DSM-5. So as I, as I listed these here, it tells you that the, the, the patient will need a certain four. Out of what is listed, they will need at least five of the following, four of the following. And then it also outlines over what time frame okay. to be diagnosed with the disorder. So there's usually a little bit more technicality in putting this disorder, labeling someone with it. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Do you think some of do you think some of your patients are having like a hard time because of COVID, like doing P sessions or like any type of appointments through Zoom with all these different personality disorders and um, like um, diagnosis? Yes, it is without a doubt, um, those with mental health issues are struggling in COVID. And for several different reasons. There are some patients who are paranoid and will not engage in telephone conversations. They, who is this? Um, I don't. I didn't see your number come up on my caller ID because I, I work from home. I've been working from home since March, so I only leave my house on a Sunday to go grocery shopping. It's sad because my days are long. So I, I I work at home, so I call from my private phone, so I make my number private. And sometimes I'll have some patients where I have to have my assistant, who still works in the office. She has to three way to call from the office because they will not pick up my call because it comes up as unknown or private. Even if I leave a message, they won't. Or it goes to the patient who they have their serious mental illness and they live such a reclusive lifestyle that they look forward to leaving their house, their homes only for appointments. And they'll say, I haven't left my house in, in, in such a long time. I used to look forward to coming to see you guys or I miss seeing you. Then you have those patients who, as you enter 
as you enter your patient's life, you will find that you fill different roles for them. I had, like I had one patient on Friday, it was so sad. She is, I wanna say she is 70, like 75 years old. She lives alone and she's like, she turned up in the office on Friday and my assistant called me, she goes, can you see her? I'm like, no, she's not on my schedule today. She goes, well, she missed her last appointment because she doesn't have a phone. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'm not gonna let this woman leave her house, come all the way here to get her meds and then tell her she has to come back again in a week or two to meet with me because she doesn't have a phone at home. And in talking to her, she says, I, I have missed talking to you so much. I used to I used to leave my house to come see you. Now I have no reason to leave home. And as we got to talking, she's saying, I'm home alone. I have no food. I'm like, what are you eating? She says, I, I had some jello. I had some jello and water this morning. I'm like, what did you eat yesterday? She goes, much of the same. And I'm like, and the day before, she goes, much of the same. So not only is she home battling being alone, but she's alone without the additional support. She's majorly depressed, very anxious, not getting her needs met, where had she been coming in, we could have more, we could have had more eyes on, hands on, and gotten a better picture of what was going on with her. So it's um, kind of good that she stopped in so we could have some idea as to what she was going on. Then someone mentioned EPS. Shannon, let me see where you're going with that one. Um, you could call EPS, um, Elderly Protective Services, because she's over 65. And just they could come in and help her with some supports for food and different things like that. Okay, so I chuckled because you put EPS, but what is EPS in my world? Oh, EPS. Extra pyramidal symptoms. Yes. Oh. Oops. That's okay. So I'm going to take, no, what did you, you said elderly protective services? Yeah. So you can anonymously call elderly protective services on someone and they can go do a wellness check and then they can offer like to do supports in the community for them. Yes. I did have my assistant reach out to like our office manager to see if we couldn't get her one, a home health aid. She, she's in her 70s, she walks with a hunchback, she says, I have all my garbage in my apartment because it's too far to go to the dumpster and I'm afraid. She yeah. says, I have no food, I don't have a ride to the grocery store, someone took my EBT card, she doesn't have my, I, it was so sad on Friday when I got off the phone with her, so sad. Well, if you call them, they will step in and they will help her with all that. I will most definitely get on this tomorrow, thank you. You're welcome. Um, as you said, EPS, so, so this is a struggle too. So I have my patients who are taking antipsychotics and they're at home. How do I do my AIMS test? How do I monitor for those patients who I started an antipsychotic center still at home and I'm at home? I've been home since March, just what, like eight months of being away from my patients. So for some patients, um, I work in more than one places. For, for some places I do video calls so I can assess um, through video, but then it depends on the angle. I can't see well. So like for those patients, I'll ask them to come into the office. The providers are not in the office, but the medical assistants are, and the and the nurses are. So for those patients, I'll ask them to come into the office where the nurse will do the the AIMS test and and get back to me. And you you have those patients who are truly suffering because of as they put it, everything going on in the world. Imagine this patient who was always paranoid that the world is going to end. And everybody's walking around with masks on. And you have to wash your hand. And you can't go here. And you can't go there. So it heightens their anxiety, heightens their paranoia, heightens everything that's going on. So it is a bit of a struggle for a lot of patients. You have those patients who have depression, who now they can't go out and hang with friends. They can't have people over. They have to stay in their house alone. It increases their depressive symptoms, increases their anxiety. So COVID has been a big struggle. I must say, when this whole thing started, I was like, am I going to have a job? Because I can't go into my office. I can't sit in a locked in a room talking to anybody. And I was a bit uncertain of my future as, as a site nurse practitioner. Little did I know. I'm getting more work than ever before. Like my schedule stays full, always have new intakes. I'm, every, I'm getting a call from left, right, and center. Can you start? Um, can you give us some hours? Can you? No, I'm full. I'm, I'm booked. So it has definitely affected psychiatric mental health treatments. 
A lot of patients have I've seen an increased rate of hospitalizations uh, also surrounding COVID because it is a heightened state of anxiety for everyone, even those without mental illness. So just imagine those who, who were already struggling prior. Any questions? I guess we could take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for suicide. It is now 6.11, so I'm going to say 6.21. So I'll see you guys then. Sounds good.